9.40 a.m., March the 3rd, 1991. After a short 17-minute trip from Denver, United Airlines Flight 585 is on final approach into Colorado Springs. It looks like a perfect day for flying, but there's trouble in the air. Nice looking day. Hard to believe the skies are unfriendly. There's been heavy turbulence during the flight and violent gusts of wind are forecast over Colorado Springs. Never driven to Colorado Springs and not gotten sick. <laughs> At the controls is 52-year-old Captain Harold Green, a pilot with 20 years experience and a sterling reputation. Green's co-pilot is Patricia Eidson. At 42, she's one of the first female flight officers in United's history. Flight attendants, prepare for landing. At Colorado Springs Municipal Airport, air traffic controller James Rayfield is ready to bring Flight 585 in. United 585, report the airport in sight. Got it? Yep. Airport in sight, United 585. Lower landing gear. United 585 is cleared for a visual approach to runway 35. Weather conditions, wind 320 degrees at 16, gusting at 29. As its speed decreases, flight 585 becomes more vulnerable to the turbulence. Eidson wants to know what other planes have experienced on landing. Any reports lately of any loss or gain of airspeed? Yes, ma'am. 500 feet, a 50 knot loss. At 400 feet, a 50 knot gain. And at 150 feet, a gain of 20 knots. Sounds adventurous, thank you. Starting on down. Less than three kilometers from the airport, retired policeman Harold Darnell is on his way to a local flea market. A kilometer overhead, Green and Eidson focus on keeping their speed constant as they descend. Wait, a 10 knot change here. Yeah, I know. Awful lot of power to hold that airspeed. As United 585 approaches the runway, Darnell feels something strange. Oh, what the heck was that? Out of nowhere, a powerful gust of wind strikes his vehicle, almost blowing him off the road. Another 10 knot gain. Three flaps. From the control tower, James Rayfield can now see Flight 585's final approach. As the aircraft closes in on the airport, the ride gets even bumpier. Well, we're at a thousand feet. Then, without warning, the 737 starts to spin out of control. Oh, God, sick. Rescue workers arrive within minutes, but there's almost no sign of the 737. The shattered remains of the 38-ton jet lie buried in a fire-blackened impact crater. The plane didn't, it didn't skate or bounce, you know, like, a, like when a plane comes in normally and lands, it just nosed right in and where it hits, where it stayed. And I came down here and this is when I saw all of the, it was horrible. There are no survivors. 
All 20 passengers and five crew members are killed instantly by the high-speed impact and exploding jet fuel. In 10 violent seconds, Colorado Springs has become the site of one of the most mysterious air crashes in aviation history. Nightfall, investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board descend on Colorado Springs. Known to insiders as tin kickers, NTSB investigators examine over 2,000 aviation accidents a year, at times by picking through the metal debris of fallen aircraft. While coroners mark the location of human remains in red, NTSB investigators mark scraps of metal in yellow, looking for clues to help them solve the mystery of Flight 585. Like investigating a mass murder, it's a tough job walking onto a crash site. Among the investigators assigned to the case is Malcolm Brenner, a specialist in human performance. His job will be to find out if the crash was caused by pilot error. The area was cordoned off by police and uh, there were uh, Salvation Army trucks. I got a cup of coffee, a cup of hot chocolate or something, and I uh, thanked them for it and they said, no, no, thank you, and they had this look in their eyes like, my God, you have to go into this site. Clues to the fate of United 585 lie mangled in a deep black hole. The fuselage is crushed like an accordion in the impact crater. The rest of the plane is in pieces spread over an area smaller than a football field. There was a lot of fire damage, there had been a fire afterwards, and it was all contained in a relatively small area, which, uh, just initial impression, it can be a sign that the airplane was intact. Uh, if there was a mid-air explosion or something came off the airplane, you'd expect that to be. Uh, a, a much larger site. My first sense that it was going to take some time in the, to investigate the accident was, was the damage that we saw in the parts. Uh, when they're burnt and uh, broken, uh, the, the process always takes longer. But with their work just beginning, members of the NTSB have no clue that the case of United 585 will become the longest crash investigation in aviation history. A clear late winter day in 1991 turned deadly in just 10 short seconds. Moments from landing in Colorado Springs, United Airlines Flight 585 fell out of the sky at 370 kilometers per hour. Crash! Crash! All 20 passengers and five crew members died. The National Transportation Safety Board begins a painstaking investigation into the crash. Engine turbines, hydraulic pressure gauges, the cockpit voice recorder and in-flight data recorder are all carefully extracted from the site, photographed and sent to the lab for analysis. An important first step in the investigation is the analysis of the cockpit voice recorder. With pilot error a factor in 70% of air disasters, Malcolm Brenner's job is to see what role pilots Green and Eidson played in the crash. This crew was, and I felt this at the time, was one of the more impressive crews I'd ever dealt with. There was a little bit of, of tension release, a little bit of humor. The captain said, Never driven to Colorado Springs and not gotten sick. The first officer suggested that they add extra speed as a safety margin. The captain agreed with it. It was good interaction. Got it? Yep. Airport in sight, United 585. Lower landing gear. This is a sense of, a, of an, an excellent crew. 
caught randomly, if anything. So again, uh, that was my first impression, is that this would be consistent more with a hardware situation. As more about Flight 585 becomes known, mechanical failure becomes a serious suspect. Just seconds before it crashed, the plane rolled onto its back and spun wildly out of control. Investigators wonder if the sudden motion was caused by the plane losing an engine or a wing. From the state of the aircraft on site, it's clear that it was intact at the time of the crash. What investigators don't know is if the engines were still working at impact. Technicians examined the engine turbines. They discover dirt has been drawn deeply into every crevice. These blades were clearly spinning and sucking in air at the time of impact. The engines may have been running, but technicians aren't sure how well. The plane's hydraulic pressure dials are destroyed, their glass covers broken. The indicator needles have been snapped off by the force of the impact, but even these ravaged dials tell a tale. On close inspection, investigators find a critical mark. At the moment of impact, a dent was made on the faceplate by the jarred indicator needle. It proves that when United 585 crashed, its engines were running normally. With engine failure ruled out, there seems to be only one other mechanical explanation for why 585 suddenly rolled over and then fell out of the sky. It appears increasingly likely that the plane had suffered a catastrophic problem with its flight controls. Investigators quickly become suspicious of the rudder at the back of the tail. We focused in after eliminating uh, other flight control surfaces that we thought could contribute to the roll. Uh, we started looking at the rudder. Bring that up so I can take a look at it. Investigators begin their examination of the rudder on site, but the violence of the crash makes the job extremely difficult. Almost nothing left. Most of the plane's parts are too crushed or burned for testing, but a vital component is still reasonably intact. The power control unit, or PCU. Used constantly during flight, especially during landings, the PCU performs like a car's power steering. When the pilot pushes on a rudder pedal, the PCU uses hydraulic fluid to convert gentle movements of a pilot's foot into the pressure needed to move the 737's enormous rudder. The heart of the PCU is something called the dual servo valve. Shaped like a soda can, it has two slides which glide past one another, directing the flow of pressurized hydraulic fluid that moves the rudder. The servo valve is, is very unique, that it is, in effect, two valves in one, and that that creates a whole range of interactions that don't occur in a, in a more conventional hydraulic valve. When a technician opens the power control unit, chips of metal are found floating in the hydraulic fluid. It's a disturbing find. These particles could cause the servo valve to jam, making it impossible to work the plane's rudder. It's a chilling prospect. Could a microscopic fault bring down a 38-ton jet? It's difficult for Phillips to tell. While more intact than much of the wreck, the PCU and dual servo valve are both damaged. Uh, the airplane uh, crashed and burnt in a pretty confined area and there was a lot of damage to the flight control com components and the things we were testing and needed to test and look, look at. Uh, the more damaged the components are, the harder it is to, to uh, take measurements and uh, do functional testing. To test what he does have, Phillips travels to California, to the labs of Parker Hannifin, where the rudder control unit is made. Mm -hmm. 
The curious metal chips floating in the PCU's chambers are dismissed. Phillips is told that filters keep them out of the delicate servo valve that directs fluid and moves the rudder. Nothing else is found that could explain any sudden movement of the rudder on flight 585. We didn't have any absolute indication or information that we could point to that said the rudder, power control unit, the servo valve, or any, any part of that flight control system caused that accident. Phillips still suspects a mechanical problem, but with no conclusive evidence that the PCU or servo valve caused the crash, he's forced to sign off on the tests. It's a pass. With Phillips at a dead end, only bad mountain weather remains as a primary suspect. An expert on weather-related aviation accidents, Greg Salatolo is trying to determine if heavy winds on the day of the crash were a factor. There is a, is a history of, of events where there have been airplane accidents attributed to mountain waves or rotors. In 1966, a BOAC 707 near Mount Fuji uh, disintegrated in a mountain wave and rotor. High winds crashing over mountain peaks leave so-called wind rotors in the lee side. Invisible, highly turbulent downdrafts that come plunging down with devastating power and are extremely dangerous to aircraft. We found a great deal of evidence uh, looking at the surface upper air data and talking to witnesses in the area that rotors were a possibility. An explosion, it was right over there. Right Salatolo there. hears several eyewitness reports of bizarre mountain weather on the day of the crash. One of the most intriguing is from Harold Darnell. Oh, what the heck was that? Whose truck was struck by a powerful gust of wind just moments before 585 crashed. But as Greg Salatolo combs through his evidence, the theory that a wind rotor knocked the plane from the sky is getting less and less likely. Nice looking day. Hard to believe the skies are unfriendly. Wind rotors are areas of extremely low barometric pressure. So if flight 585 did pass through one, its altimeter reading would have spiked as the plane was blown suddenly upwards. There's no evidence uh, that we saw that on the flight data recorder of, of 585. What the flight recorder did show was a fast and deadly drop in altitude as the plane fell to Earth. It's been 21 months since the investigation into the crash of United Flight 585 began. Almost two years in which the NTSB has studied the crew, the weather, the rudder, and thousands of other pieces of evidence. They've come up empty-handed. For only the fourth time in its history, the NTSB releases a report which doesn't reach a conclusion. The cause of the crash of Flight 585 is undetermined. We had put a lot of time and effort in, into the investigation and we just weren't sure what had happened. It was like he was tracking a serial killer. He was frustrated that they had not solved 585. He did not want that to happen again. But almost two years after the report on 585 is released, the killer strikes again. At 7 p.m. on a clear, windless day, US Air Flight 427 is nearing Pittsburgh. Captain Peter Germano and First Officer Chuck Emmett are getting ready for their final approach. Folks, from the flight deck, we should be on the ground about 10 more minutes. Sunny skies, a little hazy. Flight attendants, please prepare for landing. I ask you to check the security of your seatbelt. Thank you. U.S. Air 309, descend and maintain 6,000. As they close in on the airport, the pilots are on the lookout for another flight about 10 kilometers ahead of them. Looking for the traffic. 
turning 100, US Air 427. I see the jet stream. As they pass through the turbulence Whoa. left behind by the other flight, their jet suddenly and alarmingly rolls left. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, shoot! Nothing the pilots do seems to have any effect. What the hell is this? What the go? Oh. Rescue crews arrive quickly, but the fate of Flight 427 is tragically clear. There's no hope for the 132 passengers and crew. The human carnage is so bad, authorities declare the crash site a biohazard. U.S. Air 427 accident was the first U.S. accident where biohazard suits were used, and it, it made it more difficult they were uncomfortable, they were hot, and to this day, when I put on a pair of rubber gloves, for any reason, I'm instantly transformed back to the site in Pittsburgh. Captain John Cox, a 737 pilot and a flight system specialist with the Airline Pilots Association, is asked to join the team investigating the crash of Flight 427. As coroners attempt to collect human remains, NTSB lead investigator Tom Houter already knows his hunt for clues will be long and painstaking. When we first arrived at the crash site, um, well, first of all, there was no aircraft there. There were only bits and pieces of the airplane. It wasn't really recognizable as an airplane. With the help of eyewitnesses, information from the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder, Investigators begin to quickly see some striking similarities between 427 and the unsolved case of United 585. In fact, they seem to be mirror images of each other. On final approach, United 585 rolls right, while US Air 427 rolls to the left. Oh God, flip. Hang on, hang on. Both crews are caught by surprise. And after just a few terrifying seconds, both aircraft plummet straight into the ground. Certainly the whole team was aware of the previous accident with United 585 in Colorado Springs. We try to keep that in the back of our minds and take a look at this one as to what it presents to us. As the investigation continues, the list of similarities grows. 427's engines were also attached and functioning at the time of impact. But for all the similarities, there's one important difference. Unlike United 585, as US Air 427 approached Pittsburgh, weather conditions were dead calm. Uh, folks from the flight deck, we should be on the ground about 10 more minutes. Sunny skies, a little hazy. Taking a look at the flight data recorder information, the aircraft's approaching Pittsburgh. It's an extremely smooth night. Uh, there's just no turbulence at all. Uh, the pilots are relaxed, they're talking about the landing. Flight attendants, please prepare for landing. I ask you to check the security of your seatbelts. Thank you. As he did in the case of United 585, Greg Phillips will once again lead the investigation into the mechanical aspects of the crash. Almost immediately, he makes a promising discovery. Miraculously, much of US Air 427's tail and rudder appear intact. The hydraulic devices inside the tail have also sustained very little damage. Phillips and Houter prepare to send the parts to the manufacturer, Parker Hannafin, for testing as soon as possible. They need answers. 
pressure on the NTSB to solve the accident is growing quickly. Not only are the crashes of flights 585 and 427 disturbingly similar, both of them involve the same kind of airplane, a Boeing 737. But with serious questions being raised about the plane's safety, billions of dollars and perhaps the airline industry itself are at risk. We couldn't live with the fact as investigators of having two unsolved 737 accidents. The airplane is in too much use, too wide a use around the world. It carries too many people every day. Unsolved was not an acceptable answer. If 427 was an undetermined accident, we could not find the cause of this accident, there was a great chance that if there was a, if there was a third accident with the 737 fleet under similar circumstances, that the 737 fleet would have been grounded. Careful with it. The investigation into the crash of Flight 427 may be the most important in the history of the NTSB. But it won't be easy. Answers are still years away. In just three years, two Boeing 737s have crashed in the United States with no survivors. In both cases, the planes were moments from landing. And in both cases, the planes were under full power, but the pilots were unable to control their jets. In the crash of United Flight 585, NTSB investigators were unable to find a cause. Now they're searching for clues into the second crash, US Air Flight 427. As the investigator in charge, I never allowed myself to think this investigation could go undetermined. Just, we kept on pushing and kept on researching. As long as we had things to research, we kept on going. To find their killer, the NTSB can't afford to rule anything out. From the possibility that a collision with birds brought 427 down, to strange, even bizarre theories. They looked at electromagnetic interference. They got calls from people saying it might be Russian death rays. They considered everything. There were a couple of witnesses who gave reports of the aircraft uh, suddenly descending and hovering before it blew up. We discounted those. But the investigation's primary suspect is the dual servo valve, part of the power control unit that moves the 737's rudder and a suspect in the crash of United 585. Parker Hannafin made the valve. At its lab in California, investigators look inside the main cavity of the US Air Power Control Unit. Just like in the earlier crash, they find tiny chips of metal floating in the hydraulic fluid. But once again, Parker and Boeing repeat their claim. Filters designed to stop any debris from interfering with the delicate metal slides have done their job. Investigator Greg Phillips wants to be absolutely sure. If the chips were blocking the slides, they would have left tiny scratch marks behind where they rubbed against the metal. But Phillips can't find any. Another pass. Okay. Phillips has technicians put the servo valve from flight 427 through as many tests as he can think of, trying to find a weakness. If he can find one, it could explain why two planes were ripped from the sky. But he comes up empty. That, that unit passed all its operational tests. There wasn't any indication that it had failed, and it, it operated within the parameters we expected it, it to. Once again, the investigators are forced to shift their focus back to the pilots. By studying the plane's flight data recorder, investigators know that the jet's rudder was deployed fully to one side, what's called rudder hardover. We were definitely focused on a rudder, on, on, on hardover rudder, uh, full rudder uh, input for about 20 seconds. It can be caused either by hardware, something unknown in the hardware, or it can be caused by pilot input. 
First Officer Chuck Emmett, who was flying 427, did indeed step down hard on his rudder and then held it there while the plane plummeted towards the Earth. It raised a grisly question. Was he trying to fly the plane into the ground? In, in looking at this, and being a pilot myself, it's like, this doesn't seem like rational behavior. What the hell is this? Human performance specialist Malcolm Brenner listens closely for evidence on the cockpit voice recorder. What the in this case, they had microphones right by their mouths, and you can hear as well as in real life or better, you can hear uh, breathing sounds. Hmm. Yeah, I see the jet stream. The cockpit recordings indicate that Flight 427's troubles began at the moment it flew through the jet wake of a Delta Airlines 727 that had just passed in front of them. Both pilots are startled by the wake. I see the jet stream. The first officer breaks off at the end of a sentence. I, I see the jet stream, zuh. And there's no more discussion of the jet stream or anything else. They both focus, something happened here. Captain says, she's. It was such a smooth flight that it was a momentary jolt that they just hadn't anticipated. And with that, uh, the pilots got on the controls and immediately you know, put in a rudder input. The cockpit recorder even records the thumping sound of the jet stream turbulence as 427 flies through it. As Flight 427 encounters the turbulence, Brenner hears something unusual. First Officer Emmett begins to grunt. The grunting is unusual. Uh, the controls are designed so that pilots don't need to grunt. They're specially designed around human capabilities. So to have someone grunting is typically a sign of an emergency. Good. By matching data from the flight recorder with the crew's voices, Brenner is able to confirm that Emmett's grunts begin a split second after he pushed down on the rudder pedal and three to four seconds after the wake turbulence affected Flight 427. What the Go hell? On their own, the cockpit voice recordings prove very little. But it seems clear that the crew weren't trying to crash their plane. Something happened which took them by surprise. They reacted as quickly as they could, but nothing they did seemed to help. What the hell is this? It's been almost two years since the crash of Flight 427, and the investigation has stalled. Now two 737s have gone down in startlingly similar ways, and investigators still don't know why. We were all frustrated as months wore into years. What were we missing? It definitely took a toll in their personal lives. They worked incredibly long hours. They never stopped thinking about it. We were going up against an aircraft that had an incredible safety history. It was really a, everything you could see for 30 years. This has been a great airplane. Um, we were trying to prove that there was something wrong with the straight-A student. It clearly was on his mind. He, at one point, had a nightmare about it where he dreamed that he was in front of a congressional committee that was grilling him on now there had been a third 737 crash and in Tom's dream all the cameras were pointing to him and a congressman asked why didn't you ground the fleet unsure of where to look next and with the trail of evidence getting colder investigators need a break in the case and fast you're clear for landing. On June the 9th, 1996, they finally get the break they've been looking for. Captain Brian Bishop is on final approach to Richmond, Virginia, when, without warning, his east wind jet rolls sharply to the right. We didn't know to what extent, but we knew we had a problem with the rudder. I turned the yoke the opposite direction, stood on the opposite rudder pedal. But the pedal didn't move for me. For over 30 seconds, the 737 flies in a precarious right bank as Bishop fights to keep it from rolling over. 
Then suddenly, the unknown forces holding the jet let go, snapping the wings back to horizontal. In a matter of seconds, uh, it released itself and went back to normal. We had started the checklist. Almost before I could finish the sentence, all of a sudden there was a, just a wham. For a second time, the 737 is pushed onto its side. For 30 harrowing seconds, the 737 takes on a life of its own. Then, once again, as quickly as it began, the rollover stops. After the second time, I looked at the first officer and I said, declare an emergency. Tell the controller we have flight control problems. As they slow down to land, the risks increase. If a third rollover occurs, they won't have enough airspeed to recover. I, I did at some point tell my first officer to look out the window find a dark spot. It was nighttime and we were, we were looking to avoid a neighborhood or a populated area. And he very calmly uh, responded that, hey, here's a spot over here. But there is no third rollover. Bishop brings flight 517 in high and fast and lands safely. Taxing in is, is when I realized my legs were shaking. We got the aircraft to the gate, and I did pick up the PA to make an announcement to try to explain what had just happened to these people. And I'm picking up their microphone, I realized there was nothing I could say to make this any better. Uh, and probably for the first time in a long time, I was at a loss of words. So I simply put the microphone down and uh, let it go with that. But Bishop won't remain speechless for long. By the next day, the investigation team has arrived in Richmond. Flight data recorded it was undamaged, an airplane undamaged, we launched to the scene. The, the airplane literally didn't move, uh, stayed at its location in the airport till we got down there. Uh, there were a lot of FAA, a lot of NTSB, and they all wanted to talk to us very badly. It gave the NTSB uh, a tremendous break because suddenly they had a 737 that had had a rudder incident that was intact and they had a pilot who was alive and who could talk about it. I think they were much happier to have the airplane than me. Uh, I think the airplane probably gave them more to research than I ever could. NTSB investigators quickly determined that what happened on board Eastwind Flight 517 is alarmingly similar to events on flights 427 and 585. If they can discover why Bishop 737 rolled over, they may be able to crack two mysterious and fatal accidents. And, and when we said, well, what happened? They said, there was something wrong with the rudder pedal. The pedal wouldn't go down. I was standing on the rudder pedal and I couldn't get it to go down. It, my God. With Bishop's first person testimony, investigators immediately zero in on Eastwind's rudder controls. The power control unit is removed, inspected, and then tested again and again. To the frustration of everyone, the unit performs perfectly. We tested that aircraft as is. It was intact. We went through a complete leave, did flight tests with it, and it passed all tests. After a five-year hunt for clues, a third mysterious rudder event on a 737, and a live pilot as a witness, Tom Houter still lacks the evidence he needs to crack his case. He decides to push his chief suspect, Flight 427's rudder controls a little harder. One fellow mentioned a test they had done in the military of a thermal shock, where if you had the actuator being very cold and put in very hot hydraulic fluid, 
it would cause it to react in strange ways. So we put together a thermal shock test. And this test was extreme to say the least. On August the 26th, 1996, in Valencia, California, NTSB investigators gather to watch the torture test of US Air 427's PCU. After soaking it in dry ice, the PCU is blasted with nitrogen gas to simulate the minus 40 degree temperatures at 10,000 meters. Then it's quickly injected with superheated hydraulic fluid and given the command to start working. As we were standing there listening to the, the actuator move left and right, left and right, it stopped and it was not commanded to stop. It just jammed. It stopped working completely. Take a look. <laughs> Systems investigator Greg Phillips now asks that the valve be taken apart and scanned for scratches. They find none. Look at that. Doesn't leave a trace. It's a crucial breakthrough to solving an almost perfect crime. Not only have they proven that the valve which controls the rudders can jam, no evidence is left behind. Tom Houter and his team have now found that a small hydraulic valve that controls the rudder of the world's most popular commercial jetliner can jam in the right circumstances. It's an ominous discovery, but incredibly, there's another shocking surprise in store for the investigators. October the 15th, 1996. For the last five years, the National Transportation Safety Board has been struggling to crack its toughest case. Two completely separate, but seemingly linked accidents. The crash of United 585 killed 25 passengers and crew. Three years later, the US Air Flight 427 disaster took another 132 lives. Now, after examining hundreds of clues, investigators have made a surprising discovery. A new test has revealed that under the right circumstances, the hydraulic valve that moves the 737's rudder can jam just jammed. But the surprises aren't over. The most important breakthrough came when a Boeing engineer examining the data from that test discovered some numbers that indicated the valve at that point had actually reversed. Whoa. It's a stunning revelation. Not only can the servo valve jam, but it can then function in reverse. It means that any time a pilot tries to correct a rollover by pushing on the rudder, the rudder might turn in the opposite direction, causing a fatal accident. And the reversal is like driving your car. You turn to the right, it goes left. You're not going to figure out this failure mode until you go off the road. And in these cases, that's the pilots we're, we're faced with, something so unusual that they didn't understand what was happening. <laughs> They had evidence now that the valve was unique, that the valve not only could jam, but would reverse. 427, emergency! That would explain why the first officer, Chuck Emmett, would keep his foot on the rudder pedal, because he's thinking, why isn't the plane going right? and he's feeling the plane go to the left. To the very end, Chuck Emmett pushes hard, hoping his rudder will help him pull out of his deadly spiral. Tragically, he has no way of knowing that he's steering the aircraft straight into the ground. Never driven to Colorado Springs and not gotten sick.
Flight attendants, prepare for landing. Satisfied that they've determined the cause of the crash of US Air 427, the NTSB turns its attention to the unsolved case of United 585. Another pin out thing. Going back to Colorado Springs, and you could follow a progression of what the captain was doing. He's close to the ground, and suddenly, under rudder reversal, he puts in a little bit of pedal. The pedal violently pushes his leg back. Oh, God! Fifteen flaps! Fifteen! Rudder reversal certainly fits what I know about this crew and how it fits. We were able to show the failure mode. It matched the flight data recorder from each aircraft. It felt like a glove. So we now had a lot more information we could apply to United 585. And based on that, we redid the accident report. Oh my God! Oh my God! From rudder reversal to impact took less than 10 seconds. 585's flight crew had no chance to save their plane or passengers. In the aftermath of the investigation, sweeping changes were made to improve the safety of the 737 and the entire aviation industry. New training protocols were designed to help pilots react to unusual in-flight events. In the 737 fleet, pilots are now trained on how to react to both rudder hardovers and reversals. The scenario of the US Air 427 accident if the crew had the information that we have today, I believe they would have landed safely in Pittsburgh that evening. The FAA also directed Boeing to redesign the rudder's dual servo valve to eliminate the potential for reversal. Boeing spent hundreds of millions of dollars to replace the valves on thousands of 737s around the world. One thing we don't like at the safety board is to have an undetermined accident because then we can't make a change to improve safety. So out of US Air 427, United 585, we have a much safer 737 fleet. It took NTSB tin kickers 10 years to solve the mysterious crashes of flights 585 and 427. The longest investigation in aviation history there are still some people in aviation who don't think the NTSB got it right. But I became convinced after talking to many, many, many people, pilots, engineers, people at Boeing, uh, and spending a lot of time with the investigators, that they did get it right. Since the replacement of the 737 servo valves, there hasn't been a similar crash of the most popular, most profitable plane in the world. <laughs>